Okay. Let's uh, pick up where we left off. So, lipotoxicity seems to make sense as a theory. Less oxidation, more uptake means more storage of fat in the muscle. Not only fat, triglycerides, diglycerides, ceramides. I didn't show you the, uh, the data that says all of those go up, uh, but they do. More storage in the muscle means more things are around to interfere with insulin signaling. Now the question is how, right? Why would fat in the cell just deactivate an enzyme? And you might think, well, any enzyme in the cell is just a matter of form and function. Enzymes work because they're shaped the right way. Enzymes work on one specific thing because it's the key to the enzyme's lock. Question? No? You're good? Yeah, so, so if an enzyme works, the substrate is the right fit for that enzyme. Maybe these fat molecules are the right fit and they disrupt normal enzyme function. But somehow, a fat molecule will interfere with a, with a protein enzyme. Somehow. How might that occur? And then how might the transition, how might the gradual accumulation of dysfunction occur? And I really think that the second theory provides a fairly plausible mechanism for how the accumulation of fat in the cell might disrupt or interfere with enzyme activity. Because right now, we're just saying there's these globs of fat. Maybe they bump into enzymes. Maybe they stick to them. Maybe they don't work as well for some reason because they fit together really well. We don't know. That doesn't seem very plausible. But I kind of think that the accumulation of fat in the cell is indicative of a high supply of energy and the resulting dysfunction at the mitochondria can impact enzyme function directly. How does it do that? Through the production of free radicals or reactive oxygen species. So I'm going to show you how reactive oxygen species develop specifically. These are oxygen molecules or derivatives that have more electrons that aren't supposed to exist, that are really reactive. They are a type of free radical. There are other kinds of free radicals, but I'll end up kind of using those interchangeably. I'm specifically referring to reactive oxygen species. Now normally, this happens. I'm painting with a, with a wide brush that ROS are bad. They're disruptive. But they are produced normally, and they are a signal inside the cell. We try to control it really well, but they're a signal like a hormone would be a signal, perhaps. Just inside of the cell. If there's some ROS produced, that means something's happening, and we want to bring about some change, some effect. In high amounts, it's disruptive, but it's one of the reasons why you can adapt to exercise training. The production of ROS at the mitochondria is required for you to become more fit. And we've seen that in individuals that uh, started a training program taking high doses of vitamin E and vitamin C, which are antioxidants, which prevent ROS formation. Their training effect was blunted. They didn't get as fit. So whatever the effects of vitamin C and vitamin E were, we think that it's in reducing reactive oxygen species. It prevented them from experiencing the same training response. This is what I mean by hormesis with exercise. Hormesis is, I'm going to stress the cell just a little bit by making some of these reactive oxygen species, but I'm only going to do it temporarily and in a small amount, and then the cell will adapt. Hormesis is adaptation to a stress. You take antioxidants, you don't adapt as well to exercise. Isn't that crazy? So rather than fat globs in the cell stick to and disrupt enzyme activity, 
I think that the progressive accumulation, the progressive release of higher amounts of reactive oxygen species into the cell, the loss of control on the production of reactive oxygen species is the link between high energy intake and high fat in the cell and diabetes. And let me try to describe in pictures what that might represent. So let's take an enzyme. This is uh, a pentagonal enzyme. If I have this enzyme in the cell, I want to be able to control it. Sometimes I want to turn it up. Sometimes I really want to turn it up. Sometimes I want to turn it down. And I do that by modifying it, right? You've seen phosphorylated enzymes before. I add a phosphate group. Maybe I add two phosphate groups. Or maybe there's one there and I remove the phosphate group. Um, these are ways that I can modify its activity. And all I'm doing is changing the shape of it. If I had a phosphate, it makes the enzyme a slightly different shape. And um, whether enzymes work is just form and function. Is it the right lock for a specific key? So you've seen phosphorylation, dephosphorylation a lot. You can also do other things to enzymes. You could add uh, methyl groups or take methyl groups off, CH3. Um, you can add, what was that, alkyl, alkyl groups. Anyways, there are a number of different modifying factors that depending on the enzyme, you want to add them or remove them in a given situation. Usually I have a recipe. If I'm exercising, I'm programmed to add two phosphates because that makes this enzyme work the best for exercise. Everything's set up according to a program. And that program should, be, uh, should work normally. It should not be disrupted. But in a situation where I have an excessive amount of free radicals, free radicals can donate electrons, change the shape, and alter enzyme function all willy-nilly. There's no control. If there's a lot of these in the cell, depending on where they are, they can impact enzyme function. So maybe my normal uh, situation, if this is my normal situation, maybe some free radicals are present that removes a methyl and a phosphate group. Now all of a sudden, this enzyme doesn't work as well. I'm not going to be able to process the fuel that I need for exercise. Or I'm not going to be able to interpret the signal that insulin sends. All of a sudden, the enzyme's not working as well. All of a sudden, the enzyme has a different shape. This is the same enzyme, but now it's just an elongated hexagon, I guess. What this means is the shape is now different because of the influence of ROS. Therefore, it has a different function. Maybe it's better, more likely it's worse, and the result in this example is resistance to the signal sent by insulin. So in the last five minutes, I want to show you the, uh, the slides from Dr. Kane's old PhD supervisor because they will really, um, I think, put some tangible spin on this idea. Right now, you're taking my word for it that ROS are produced. And then if they're produced, they mess up enzyme function. How are they produced? <coughs> you don't have these slides, but you can just follow along. Um, this is the electron transport chain. At the risk of being overly biochemical, um, I'm showing this to you because this is where diet and exercise meet in the body. This is where energy is made in response to a demand. This is where your food goes. All of your food ends up here. What is the role of the electron transport chain? Well, we need to transport electrons. Each of these proteins within the chain, you don't even have to remember what they are, is tasked with transporting electrons and in so doing will pump protons out. One of the characteristics of the electron transport chain is that it pumps protons, creates a gradient where there are more protons outside or on top than inside. 
and creating that gradient creates a membrane potential, which is the potential to do work. And if we can harness or capture the movement back across, we can do something with it. We can make ATP, we can make energy, we can stay alive. So for this example to work, you have to understand that for electrons to move, protons have to be pumped. For a proton to be pumped, electrons have to move. These things are coupled. You can't do one without the other. All the food in your body ends up uh, as NADH, or a slightly different compound, but this is food. And then the electrons are transported through the chain where they help reduce oxygen to water. And that's the end of it. It's linear, one direction only, that's it. So we create a gradient. You can imagine, normally we use this gradient to make energy, but in a situation of a sedentary lifestyle or oversupply of energy, we're trying to push more stuff in and less is coming out of this system. What that means is that we're constantly trying to make a larger and larger gradient. And in theory, there should be a point, imagine if you did absolutely nothing and you just continued to eat. There would be a point where you would saturate the membrane, where you would have pumped so many protons out that there's a large back pressure that prevents any more from being pumped out as well. And in that situation, because proton pumping and electron movement are linked, if there's enough back pressure, the electron transport chain would stop. What happens when the electron transport chain stops? You die. Were you going to say die? I was going to say die. No energy is produced. You need energy to live. Yep. And you die. Yeah. So in this situation, notice these electrons are saturating the electron transport chain. They're not moving anywhere. They're just there. It's in this situation that they can readily produced, uh, produce reactive oxygen species. So this is oxygen that just has extra electrons on it now. These are the conditions for producing ROS. Forcing more stuff in, not pulling enough out. Eating more, not doing enough exercise. Now in practice, this never happens. You never reach a point where the electron transport chain stops completely, there's always some leak. There's always some leak, but we can create a situation where there is a very large gradient which is um, represented by this, I forget what Greek symbol that is. Tilde? Tilde? It's whatever the Y one is. I don't know. It's represented by this Greek symbol. It's shown over here on the right-hand side. If you have a high membrane potential, the flow through the electron transport chain is low. And the opposite is true as well. You, you relieve the pressure if you start to get electrons flowing. So you never completely block flow because there's some leaking through. What we would like to do, right, you never block it, some leaks through, there's always some small degree of movement. What we want to do though is to prevent this reactive situation, we want to get rid of the gradient, right? We want to uh, desaturate the electrons in the electron transport chain proteins. So what's the easiest way to get rid of the gradient? Any thoughts? Human kinetics. What's the easiest way to get rid of this gradient? You're pushing a bunch of stuff in. How do you get rid of that backlog? Push out? Uh, You have the right idea. So pull is maybe a better way to think about it. Pull out the energy that's being, pull electrons through the transport chain. Um, dismantle the gradient. Relieve the gradient. The way that we do that 
is by exercise. We create a demand. We need to produce energy, which means all of a sudden, I'm going to open up this pore in the membrane that allows protons to go back through. This is ATP synthase, where I'm capturing that energy to make ATP. That goes towards the demands of exercise. The easiest way to improve flow is to relieve the pressure, make or create an energy demand. So this, this reactive situation is caused exclusively by trying to push more energy in than we are removing via exercise. Pushing more energy into the mitochondria creates pressure, saturates the enzymes with electrons, encourages ROS formation. To remove that pressure, we need to increase the pull of electrons through the chain. We do that by creating a need for energy, by dissipating the gradient to produce ATP that allows electrons to flow freely. Excuse me. So this is where diet and exercise meet. Diets coming in on the left-hand side trying to load up electrons and create more of a gradient. Exercise is on the right-hand side trying to pull electrons through, relieve the pressure, and create an energy deficit. This is why exercise is such a systemic, effective uh, therapy for obesity and diabetes. Medication, sorry, medication can't do this. You cannot create a need for energy that is not voluntary. What you can do is you can just make a big hole in the membrane. Some, uh, the army in Russia tried to do this. It was, um, uh, I forget the name of it, but it, it circumvented the membrane. It allowed uh, protons to pull back through so you didn't have to exercise to waste the gradient because it helped them stay warm uh, during the, the winters. And also it killed a lot of people because if you lose the ability to link this to producing energy, you can't produce energy. And like we saw earlier, you don't have energy to die. So it's possible to relieve the gradient pharmacologically, but it's very, very dangerous. There's no other way to activate the, um, the, the, the phosphorylation of ADP and the creation of energy unless you create a need, unless you engage in physical activity, unless you exercise. So we have two minutes. Everything that I just said is summarized on this slide. How do you fix obesity? Number one, reduce the push into the electron transport chain. Lower food intake, reduce energy intake. It could be lower carbs. It could be lower fat. Whatever diet works for you typically is recommended, but all diets that are successful have a lower calorie content. Minimize the push of new energy into the mitochondria. If you just did that, over time, because of the leak, you would relieve the pressure. It would just take longer. So if you want to accelerate the process, not only would you stop pushing more energy in, but you would pull energy out, create a need. Increasing energy output utilizes energy, requires you to produce more, dissipates the gradient. That's the solution, the push and pull. In practice, this has to be done long term. You can do this transiently. You can develop diabetes over the course of a couple hours. It was a trick that um, I think uh, young, young kids used to dodge the Vietnam draft by eating a bunch of avocados that were really high in fat and would create temporary insulin resistance but being diabetic, they weren't drafted in the army. You can do this transiently. You can create an acute pull if you go for a quick jog. But that's not going to empty the cell of all the fat that's been stored upstream. Doing it persistently, gradually, empties out the electron transport chain, empties out the cell, gets rid of those disruptive fats, 
and everyone's healthier for it. So that's all I want to talk about today. This is a natural break point because we talk about the, uh, the cures to obesity or the cures to diabetes next. You have your midterm on Thursday. Um, let's say that I won't include information from this section on that midterm. Okay? But it's free game for the final. This is an FYI piece. Hopefully it was interesting. Any questions before we go?